All right, so this is Neil Rockheim. Welcome to another edition of Killer Cross-Examination. This is a podcast where we talk about all things related to the criminal justice system. We talk about the uh, impact of current events. We talk about cross-examination, closing argument, great lawyers, terrible lawyers. Um, and we really try to find a way to make the justice system work better for you and for you to get more justice in your own lives. And this is really a, an honor for me. This is my very first... Um, my very first guest. So my first guest on this show. So I've never, never had a guest. I've never done an interview. I hosted a radio show years ago, but it was really just me talking. Um, and I'm really uh, privileged just to have, uh, to, to have Jeff Lickman with me, who's a lawyer in New York. Uh, if you're in New York, I think Jeff, your name, it goes like, I, you would probably be one of those guys who needs no introduction, right? Well, uh, I would always love a nice introduction, so you know, feel so free. Let me, let, let me give you some fluffery here. So for those of you who don't know, New York is, uh, is sort of considered to be the, the center of the criminal defense universe. Like every great, tough, except for a few, but most of the great, tough, well-known criminal defense lawyers have come out of New York because those guys have to deal with the just the, the, the most significant cases, some of the gnarliest prosecutors, the most difficult, um, um, I think Manhattan prosecutor's office, the Eastern District of New York, or the Southern District of New York. These are the, the lawyers that make it to the, to the top in the city of New York and the city of New York are generally the cream of the crop. And to get there, you have to just be tenacious. Um, Jeff, who I happen to know through a mutual friend, Steve Haney, Jeff is represented um, just about everybody who's who in New York City. Uh, I think two names that people who really aren't criminal justice aficionados will recognize. Of course, you represent John, John Gotti Jr. Um, and most recently you represented El Chapo. Is that right? That's um, right. Jeff is, um, he also hosted a radio show uh, or was a, uh, Free, I think he hosted a radio show for several years and is a recurring guest on a radio show. He's been on Court TV. Basically, if, if you're in trouble in the city of New York and you haven't reached out to contact Jeff Lickman, then whomever gave you the names of lawyers out there did a really piss poor job of recommending people. So the reason, Jeff, why I wanted to chat with you is that, first of all, Steve just says you're, you're the greatest lawyer that he's ever met, which hurt my feelings a bit. But after I saw some of your victories and I read some of your the, your articles um, that people have written about you, it seems that um, the the praise is, is well earned. So tell me a little bit. What how would you consider your style? What's your courtroom style? Wow, um, you know I, I learned how to be a lawyer um, really at the the feet of two great men. Uh, one of them was Jimmy LaRosa, who's a well known famous criminal defense lawyer in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Um, and the other one was Jerry Shargell, who recently retired and was, was Jimmy's protege when he was a young lawyer. And I worked for and with Jerry for years as a young lawyer. So I got to watch them in court on trial for months at a time. And when you're a young lawyer, you're sort of taking it all in and you're deciding what you want to take from people that you watch, what's good, what's bad, what works for you because everybody's got a different personality and you obviously want to play to your strengths. Um, there were times I'd watch them and I'd think, well, I wish I could be like that. And there were other times I felt that there was no way that I could be like that. So you sort of pick an, uh, what works again, based on your personality. Um, I would say my style is a bludgeoning uh, style inside the courtroom. I was going to say, that's what I've read. So you're, yeah. people, people have referred to your, cross-examination as smothering pressure. Others at times, I think the media has called it a relentless pounding. You put witnesses through the blender and shred them. Another referred to, I think you were in a trial for like three and a half months and said you had delivered an astonishing performance and that you were wildly entertaining. I think so, that's, I yeah, think that's, and I'll explain. Um, you know, to be a good trial lawyer, there's a, a few things you have to have. And if you don't have any of these, you're hopeless and you probably should go into a different area of- You gotta have presence. You have to have presence, right? I mean, you gotta have presence. 
first thing is you have you have to have presence and it's not just presence you've got to have a great sense of humor because keep in mind that you're representing people that are usually wildly guilty and oftentimes at least for me the entire society hates them you've got the judge hates them the prosecutors hate them uh, the jury hates them when the case starts society hates them so you have to turn that around in a very short period of time, at least with the jury. So what's the one way that you can convince a jury to do what you want is you've got to get them to like you. I mean, this is common sense 101. Oh, such common sense. And what's funny is, is that I, I'm so glad to hear you say that and someone at, of your stature to affirm that because I've often thought that humor in the court, that one of the things missing from courtrooms, which are serious, dry, dull places, nobody goes to court because they want to be in court. You're dragged there, either divorce or business issues or a criminal case or a juror if you're dragged there. And there's something about injecting some levity. So you don't think anything's wrong with that. In fact, it sounds like you think that that's something appropriate where it's appropriate to do it. A hundred percent. I mean, every trial I've ever had, I mean, it's much like when I was doing the radio. I'm there to entertain you as well, because what's going to happen is you'll have some of the jurors, not all of them, but you'll have some say, look, I like this guy. He's made this time pleasurable. He's made me laugh. They start to like you and they're more likely to do what you ask them to do, namely, which is to acquit. I've gotten more hung juries than probably any lawyer in New York City in the last 15 years. And it's mainly because no matter how bad the case is for the defense, I can convince one, two, three, four jurors not to convict. So the sense of humor and the presence in the courtroom is one thing that you have to have. If you don't have it, if have you ever, Jeff, have, do you start? So I read an article where you talked about um, what's his name, Pharma Boy. Um, you know, I'm talking about you, 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 you commented, what's the kid's name? The kid is, you know, the one. Martin. Um, yeah, yeah, Shkreli. Yes. And you, you commented on the way the jury selection from your perspective, I think you were offering some legal analysis was going, was ongoing. And you thought that, that maybe it hadn't taken the best turn or that you thought that there should, they have to humanize him. Would you, would, I mean, t tell me about that. Do you watch trials like that and think I, this is how I would do it or I would do it differently? Um, I, I stopped watching trials. God, it's got to be 20 something years ago because I found that it, if I wasn't involved, I was bored. Um, but with regard to, you know, the only person I'm really interested in, in seeing try a case is myself, of course. Um, that's, that's another thing that a good defense. Ego, you got to have an ego, right? Bad. Exactly, because if you can't convince yourself that you're going to win the case, how are you going to convince 12 people that are sitting there in the jury? Um, I think you need to humanize. And I've had some clients that are not exactly, at least according to society, the very humane people. So you need to do little things during the trial to make the jury understand this person's not a monster. I had it with Gotti. Um, I had it with uh, El Chapo. Um, I've had it with other people that I've gone to trial with you know, drug kingpins, um, crooked politicians, you name it. You've Give got me a couple examples of ways that you have humanized, like John Gotti Jr., for example. The name is, I mean, it's so you just need to hear the name Gotti, and you all of a sudden have, I mean, very visceral and visual imagery comes to mind. So, how did you humanize him in that case? Well, in that case, you know, John and I became very close friends um, before that trial. Um, true story. He got indicted two weeks before my twins were born, 10 weeks prematurely. So my kids were in the hospital for nine weeks or so while I was preparing for John's case. And he would say to me every time I'd visit him in prison, you don't need to be here deal with your kids. I know that when the trial starts and it started a year after he was charged, I know you're going to be prepared because I know that this trial means a lot to you. He trusted me completely. And therefore it allowed me to have a real warm, legitimate, warm feeling for him. By the time the trial started, I considered him like a brother, which again, doesn't happen very often. So during that trial, you know, I was constantly, I had my arm around him. We would talk, we would laugh in front of the jury. There was one instance that happened, and this is a true story that never, I don't think ever got reported, and I don't think I've ever told this to anybody. I was cross-examining a killer, I think he was a killer, certainly was violent, a cooperator named Fat Sal Mangiavellani. And I am just 
beating the shit out of him on the stand. I mean, just <laughs> abusing him. And, and my style is, is oftentimes not just to beat you, but it's also to humiliate. Because if I humiliate the witness, I'm humiliating the government's case. So it's important that it's not just enough to beat you. I want to defeat you completely. And this was a big man, very physically big man, a uh, violent guy, and he's getting smaller and smaller in his seat and he's sinking down and he's sinking down and I'm just pounding him to no end. Uh, finally, um, I feel a tug on my sleeve. Now keep in mind that we're just a few feet from the jury. The jury right. was right far right. I feel a tug on my sleeve and I'm ignoring it because I'm really, I, I, you, you couldn't pull me off the guy. And finally I look and I see that it's John pulling at my sleeve. <laughs> and I look at him and in front of the jury, I'm like, what? And he says, come here, come here. So I, I go down and in a loud whisper, because we were right next to the jury, he says, you got to stop. He's crying. And, <laughs> and I kind of noticed a great that story. Al Mangiolani was wiping tears from his face because I was beating the shit out of him so bad. And John said, the jury's starting to feel bad for him. So I looked over at the jury. They looked at me. They heard the entire exchange. A few of them started to laugh. So I then went back to the podium and I said, no further questions. Uh, <laughs> jury, I, um, and that's you know, an awesome story. It was a that's funny a great story. But, but that's so that humanizes your client. It humanizes you. It's great humor. It's good shtick. It's, um, I mean, that's, do you get, do you get to voir dire in New York? Do you get to, in, in federal court, do you get to voir dire juries or do the judges do it? The judges do it, um, but which is why, and this is important because the judges, get to do it. It's very, very important that if you're a good defense lawyer and you have a personality that you want to get as much face time with the jury as possible. You want to be in front of them cross-examining. You want to do the opening. You want to do the summation. I never allow anybody else in my office, any other lawyer that I'm working for ever to examine any of the cooperators. I don't care how many of them there are in the case. My belief, and most lawyers don't do this. Most lawyers will spread the work around. I think that it's just self-defeating. I'm willing to do the work. And that's the second thing that's important as a defense lawyer. You need to outwork anybody and everybody, including the government, not by a little bit, by a lot. And I'll do every single witness in the case. Why? Because first of all, I know that it will get done better. But secondly, I need the face time to develop the relationship with the jury. Um, so that's important that you have that opportunity because you don't get the voir dire and you want to have more than just an opening and a closing. You want to be with the jury. You want them to feel comfortable so they can trust you. And one of the problems we had in the Chapo case, uh, I'm, I'm, I'll certainly admit this, is I came into the trial, into the case, two months before the trial started and had to look at all the Rule 16 evidence, which was enough to fill uh, you know, a, a gymnasium and then deal with the 3,500 material on 100 witnesses or so. So I couldn't possibly be prepared. I did the opening and the summation and and a few of the main witnesses, but I certainly couldn't do everything. So I was stuck with other lawyers who I never worked with before. And I had to sit there in anguish watching them cross-examine. And, and the reporters commented on you sitting there. They commented on the fact that you looked like you were, I think there was something like 20 or 22, maybe. It was a 22 day. Well, it's some, there, was a, there was a significant, I don't know if it was 22 days or 22 witnesses, but there was some significant period of time where you, after you gave your, your opening that you had to wait to, to get back and do something. That must have seemed like an eternity. How did you do that? How did you just sit there and... It was such physical pain to sit there, not only to not be able to do what I love to do, but to have to watch other people do it in what my mind was an inferior manner. And finally, after watching a couple of the witnesses, I said to the lawyers, I said, I'm just curious, do you guys use 3,500 material when you cross-examine? And they're like, no. I'm like, so you don't use any of the prior witness statements and show them to the witness when they say something inconsistent? No. Uh, how are they? So this is a great, this is a, how are they doing it then? How are they? Because I, I prepare, I, I, I am criticized by my peers for working day and night and thinking of this stuff. I used to, you'll laugh at this. I used to have a legal pad. Before we had iPads and phones, I had a legal pad on my nightstand because I'd lay there at night and I would think of something. And all of a sudden, 
the pieces of how this was going to go down. I would see all the ways. Of course. And, and I would think to myself, I can't wait. I can't sleep on it because if I sleep on it, I'll forget it. So I would keep a legal and I would write it out on a legal pad. And people were chuckling at me for like that. I thought I was obsessed. And I guess in a way I am obsessed, but. You have to be. How else can you win these cases? I was so surprised when I heard that, that I actually asked the paralegals. I said, is it true that, you know, he's not using the 3,500 material? And they said, he doesn't even read it. So you ask how they. He doesn't read it. How do they, how do they impeach? So I know that I know that you've done, and I want to I want to ask you about this. I know that you've gotten extremely creative in coming up with impeachment material for witnesses. But how do you, as for young lawyers who are listening, how do you impeach a witness well, without well, looking at the material? There's there's well, what you do is you take the cooperation agreement, you take what they testified to on direct. And look, you can always impeach a witness based on a cooperation agreement and their admission of wrongdoing. During yeah, the but that's like that's everyone. And they Doesn't, own that. And they own that in their the, the, the government and prosecutors try to own that in in direct and they right. try to own that. So that's that's there's nothing earth shatteringly. No, it's going to turn it, heads with that. Right. It's it's incompetent. And it's and not surprisingly, one of the lawyers ended up the, the Chapo tried to fire him during the entire trial. And finally, I, I wouldn't let him because that would have required me to do all of his witnesses. And finally, after the trial was over, he fired him immediately. Um, but what you need to do as a defense lawyer, look, if you're lazy, you're not winning a trial. Um, if you do things half assed, you're not winning a trial in terms of impeaching a witness. Half of what you can take to impeach them is what the government gives you. And what I would say is, do you really want to do your cross examinations based on material that they're aware of? They're going to object every time you ask a question because they know what's coming out of your mouth. Or do you want to do your own investigation? Do you want to find your own impeachment material that the government is not aware of? And that's the stuff that really trips up the witnesses because they're not prepared for it. They're not getting it on the direct examination. They're not. Give me impressive. some, give us some examples. I know one example that I know you've talked about publicly is Curtis Sliwa. You at one point called him. I don't know if you guys have mended fences since then, but you, you, you described him as the single worst witness that you had ever at the time, maybe that was 10 years ago, 15 years ago. It was 15 years ago. And I think he probably still is the worst witness. Um, <laughs> I said, tell me, what, what are some of the things you do for young lawyers out there? Because that you do to try to come up with impeachment evidence that, that the government is not turning over to you and saying, here, go ahead, use this to, to bludgeon our witness, good luck. What are some of the things that you've done? The government certainly is not going to dig into their backgrounds at all. They're gonna ask them, what have you done wrong? They'll tell them what they want, tell the government what they want, and they'll just ignore anything else, even if it's obvious. So what I do is I get into their finances I find out, I get their credit card information, I get their bank accounts, I get the leases that they've signed, the lawsuits they've been involved in, any kind of litigation. Um, I get very creative with this stuff. And I talk to people and they tell me where things are, where some of the so-called bodies are buried. With regard to Curtis, I knew that he was uh, selling uh, speeches based on what John Gotti had supposedly done to him. He was getting paid to give speeches about getting shot in the back of this cab. So obviously he had a financial motive to claim that this crime occurred and that Gotti had done this. So what I did is, if you can believe, and I think about it now, it's almost hard to believe that I did this, but I created a fake synagogue in New Jersey with stationery and an email address, wrote to him and said that I was the president of this fake synagogue. I knew that Sliwa, because I had examined him enough in his, his background and knew, knew that he was lazy, I said that I was the head of a synagogue, I obviously used a fake name, and um, said I wanted him to come to my temple to speak about the time he was shot, and he supposedly had this dollar that was in his pocket that was given to him by this Rebbe, and it was an, an, an angle for him to get into synagogues and get paid to give speeches, and the dollar somehow wasn't touched with any blood, even though he was completely bloody. And I asked him to speak at our temple. I then get contacted by his manager with a contract and it called for a $25,000 fee for a 50 minute talk, if you can believe. So I got it, it was signed and ready to go. And obviously then I vanished. 
And during cross-examination, again, the government was aware of some of the stuff I was gonna do. They weren't aware of this. And I said to him, in fact, you make money by talking about what you're claiming John Gotti did to you. Well, I don't know what you're talking about. I said, you give paid speeches about this shooting, don't you? Yes, I do. I said, so you have an incentive for this story to be real. Well, I suppose when you put it that way, I said, how much do you get paid for these speeches? You know, $1,000. I said, is it possible that you get paid 5,000? He says, sometimes. I said, is it possible that you get paid 10,000? He says, almost never. I said, is it possible that you get paid $25,000 for a 50 minute speech? He said, never in my life have I ever gotten paid $25,000 for a 50 minute speech. I said, are you aware, do you have a manager named, mentioned her name, yes. I said, are you aware of a synagogue named blah, blah, blah in New Jersey? He says, I'm not sure. I said, didn't you sign an agreement and brought it out? You signed an agreement to give a 50 minute speech for $25,000 and you signed it three months ago, didn't you? Yes, I did. I said, so you just lied to this jury on the stand. Well, I didn't remember. I said it was 90 days ago, correct? Yes. I said the shooting occurred 13 years ago, correct? Yes. That was one of 50 things that I did to him like that. So I got what's the government? I know they I know that they tried to object when you brought up the agreement because I read I read a passage of the, the question and answer that you had with them. And they tried to object. Um, and then you just the judge, you, you, I think you gave a quick explanation to the judge and said, it's his, it's his agreement, his contract, his representative or something. And the judge said overruled. So what was the government, what were the prosecutors doing as you're going into that material? Are you looking at them? Do you sense their reaction to that sort of stuff? Or are you just totally not even, are you just ignoring them completely and just in the zone? I'm not a good winner, just so we're clear. Um, you know, there's some... <laughs> <laughs> To have to plan. When they're winning, I have no class at all when I'm winning. So as I'm doing this, I'm literally looking at them and saying, you know, laughing in their face. The jury's laughing. They're squirming in their seats and getting lower and lower. And this went on for you know, six, eight hours. Every statement that he ever gave when he lied about his crime fighting uh, the techniques, everything was a lie. I had newspaper articles from Syracuse from 1980, I didn't get off the internet. I was getting them from microfiche in the library. When was the last time you used a microfiche machine? Well, I used it in 2004. Amazing. And, and I caught him in a lie. He, to his credit, he admitted it. All he had to say was, you know, I don't recall because I would say, you know, did you lie about this crime fighting es escapade in 1983 in Syracuse? Um, all he had to say, you know, he said, well, I don't remember what I said. I would say, isn't it true that you said X, Y, and Z, this lie? And he would say, I don't recall. I then was not allowed to read the newspaper. I had to go to him and say, would you please read the section that's highlighted and let me know if it refreshes your recollection that you said this. All he had to say was, it does not refresh my recollection. And I would not have been able to use that news article. I would have had to figure out another way to get it in. And to his credit, he owned up to every single lie. And by the time... I finished with him on cross. At one point, the judge calls me up the sidebar and she's like, look, enough already. And I said, well, why is it enough? She says, look at the jury. They're laughing in his face. I said, judge, not until I know that they're going to acquit. Am I going to stop? She's like, look, I'm telling you, giving you some good advice. You've had enough. And, and I stopped after I don't know, eight hours of just pounding the living hell out of them. And that's what you have to do. If I would have gone in there with just the impeachment that the government provided, I lose the case. And that's what every lawyer does. And this is something I would tell young lawyers. And nobody really believes it when I say it. Lawyers are so lazy by nature. They don't want to do that extra work. Now, it's not like I'm, I'm, I love to work hard. I just don't want to be embarrassed and lose cases. I want to win cases. So I where do that. that. Where does that come from? So, so I want to ask you two questions. First of all, I, I want you to walk through. You made a, 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 a comment or a point that you had to show him the art, the newspaper articles and ask if it refreshed his recollection. Was that because and you said you couldn't just read it to him? Was that because he, he hadn't seen it and he hadn't verified it? Or is it because you you were, that's the way you sort of set up the cross of him? Was the trap saying, do you remember this? And then he was saying no. And then you 
Is that, and it was it so the jury would see you hand in the article? Walk me through your thought process. Was, I didn't, I wanted to ask him, isn't it a fact that you've lied repeatedly about your crime fighting exploits? So there's yes, a, that, that's the trap. That's like the big, that's right. the big hook, right. And that, through every single lie, I went through every one of his articles, I'm talking hundreds, and I would say, and I knew that which ones were lies and which were ones weren't, most of them were completely fabricated. I would say, didn't you tell uh, the, the, the Washington Post in 1987 that you got attacked by a bunch of gorillas in the subway? And remember, 1987, maybe racism was not, people weren't as sensitive to it. And he just looked astonished. And he said, I don't recall saying that. And so I then, said, so then you, that was when you wanted to show him. Well, you, really wanted, weren't, you really weren't showing him to refresh his memory. That's just the, that's the technique you're doing to get I, to I give wanted, him a chance to deny it. Because the jury knows you're showing him something. Like they know I, that there's something. I can't right? get the article isn't self-authenticating. So what I had to do was say to him, you know, did you say this? I don't recall. And I said, that, and I walk up, you know, very dramatically with obviously a newspaper article with some uh, highlighter on it. And I would say, read that highlighted section and tell me, does that refresh your recollection that you said a bunch of gorillas uh, attack you inside the subway? He would read it and say, yes, uh, it does refresh my re recollection. And I would say, now look, at that point, the jury hates him for lying, but they hate him more for being such a damn right. racist. So he's just, he's, so how would, I, when, when you prepare, so I want to, I want to ask you a little bit about your preparation of those kinds of, of cross-examination traps. You, in, a, in one of your blog posts, you wrote that killer cross-examination is, is a dying art form. I don't know if you remember writing that, but is that, Tell me why you think that, and then I want to sort of ask you how you prepare the the traps and in, in your cross. Well, I, I didn't realize how bad lawyers prepare, how little they prepare, until I started trying cases. You know, I had worked with Jerry and Jimmy, as I said before, and you know they worked very hard. I started trying cases on my own, and I would in the Gotti case, uh, one of the lawyers would have a bunch of yellow legal uh, pages with a handful of things scribbled on them. And those were his cross-examination notes. And every time he asked a question, it required three minutes for him to find out where he was and then ask the question. That's not how I cross-examine. Is he taking notes? You know those guys that like, as the, the, as the prosecution's witnesses are testifying, they, 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 they become scriveners. They put well, their head down and they and start they, writing furiously. And they would have it, you know, maybe stapled to a yellow piece of paper with a couple of... <laughs> That's not how I do things. And it's a tell me how way. you do it. So tell me how you do it. What I do is I, everything is a theme. So everything is, is, a, is a journey. Every cross-examination is a journey. I'm starting over here with you and I want to get to over here with you. How am I going to get where you're a credible witness to you're a complete and utter clown uh, stumbling off the witness stand? It's, it's, it's a straight path if you do it right, but it's got to be a massive amount of work and you've got to shape the cross-examination to your theme. You start out, very quickly, you don't ask the typical lawyer question. Well, you know, starting out slowly. I don't start out slow. The first question out of my mouth is a punch in the face. It's a punch in the face from the beginning. I heard you like that Mike Tyson quote. The it's true. It's true. It's that it's everybody's got a great plan until you get punched in the face. So they're prepared for me, and I know they're prepared for me. And sometimes I'll say to them, I've asked a witness when I know that they've been warned about me. I've said to them as the first question. Did the government tell you about my cross-examination style? Now, look, that's a ballsy thing to say because they very well could say, I have no idea what you're talking about. But if you're a sensitive person, if you have intuition, and again, that's something a defense lawyer needs as well. You need to be a sensitive person. You can sense when the prosecutors are freaking out about you. Every time you say a word, they're you know trying to object. That tells me something that they've prepared this witness for my particular style. So I've said to a witness, the first question, did they tell you about my style? Well, yes. I said, did they go over what they expected me to do to you? Yes, they did. Did they show you any of my cross-examinations from other trials? Yes, they have. I said, so you're telling me that you read transcripts from other trials not related to this case of me cross-examining other witnesses? Yes, I did. That actually happened in a case, and uh, I was shocked that it actually worked. 
sometimes you got to take a chance. You don't want to make a mistake. But that's so powerful. Just the imagery, because it gives you the jury's looking, and of course they're thinking that this telling the truth isn't that complicated. I don't have to get on the stand and have to. This right. is probably a guy who's never read a transcript ever. That's right. So he's we never looked it, at a transcript until someone said, hey, you better read how this guy's going to come at you. Exactly. So we start out, I start out very quickly with a punch to the head. And, and then, you advocate taking chances here and there. You advocate that. I find that you can take chances and I usually do them spontaneously. My notes that I have written are, it's a very tight drum. It's all typed up. It's got every possible eventuality. It's got every uh, uh, exhibit is in, I have two different binders. One is the cross-examination and one is the exhibits in order that I'm gonna be using them in the cross-examination. I want there to be no delays at all. If I ask you a question and I need to use an exhibit, I immediately have it ready to go and I bring it over to the witness and ready to go. There is no breaks at all. I don't want you to breathe when I'm cross-examining. I love that, suffocating. That's what they, they you're, you're just gonna suffocate them, just gonna constant suffocate. pressure, like, like constant. Uh, 90, like, like, I know you went to Duke. So like, uh, with the Duke law school, right? So like, yeah. like the Duke basketball team, when they're full court press, it's going to be 90 feet of pressure. Cause we yeah. stink but every other year, but this year. And, and what we, what I do then is I start pounding at the beginning. And then after a while, when the witness sees that I've got him, you know, really tight and there's no escape, you can start taking more chances. I had this one witness named Frank Fabiano during Gotti that by the end of the cross-examination, he was sitting, looking up at the sky. Yes, yes, yes. I could have said, in fact, you're wearing uh, women's lacy underwear. Underneath. <laughs> it would have said, yes, yes, yes. Because I, it wasn't enough of having 3,500. I figured out, I did the work. I found out that he committed uh, some massive insurance fraud. The government didn't give me that, but I do the work because I don't want to be embarrassed. I don't want to lose a case. And I said to him, you know, you were, uh, you, you give these beatings, uh, the mafia, you've got different types of beatings, you've got hospital beatings, what's a hospital beating, what's a good crack, I and mean, these are all the things that I knew that he had done, and he described every type of beating that he gave, and I said, you know, you ever use a baseball bat, yes, and I said, but, you know, wasn't there a time that you were very, very ill because you got into a car accident, and all of a sudden, you, the color drained out of his face, and he said, yes, I was in a very bad car accident. The government didn't tell me about this. And I said, didn't you sue for $37 million because you got into a car accident? Yes, I did. And didn't you in the lawsuit, and I've got his lawsuit, and I said, isn't it a fact that you said that you couldn't walk for a period of years? Yes. You were in a wheelchair? Yes. That you had to wear these special thrombosis socks because you had blood clots in your, in your calves and you didn't want to die? Yes, I said, you weren't able to have sex with your wife. Isn't that true? Yes, I wrote that. And it's just a whole parade of horribles. I, I love said, it. It's great. I said, during great. this period where you claim that you couldn't do all these things, you testified on direct examination that you beat a man half to death with a baseball bat. I said, it says here in your uh, lawsuit that one of the things that you love to do was play softball and that you weren't able to play softball anymore. He said, during this time that you said you couldn't play softball, you were using a baseball bat to the head of another mobster. Did that get some of your softball, you know, some of your interest in playing softball? Did you get that out when you were beating a man half to death with a baseball bat? And, you know, he couldn't have sex. And I said, you know, you couldn't have sex because you couldn't move. But when you were <laughs> People around collecting loan shark payments. This all occurred. I said, how much money did you collect? $1.2 million. I said, you lied about your injuries, didn't you? Yes, I did. I said, you lied in front of a judge, didn't you? Yes, I did. I said, you signed a document under the penalties of perjury that you had all these injuries. Yes, I did. I, it was in a court just like this one, isn't it? Yes, I did. I said, so you lied then, but you're telling the truth now, right? Yes. I said, you lied about money then, right? Yes. I said, is your freedom less or more important to you than money? More important. Oh, so it was great. What a great, that's a great closing part of a chapter. That's brilliant. That's what great. To do. Again, if you go are into you watching the jury as you're doing this, are you, are you feeding off of them? I'm, I'm sure they're trying They're. I'm sure you're feeding off, they're feeding off of you a bit, but are you watching them or are you just again, like, yeah, I mean, I'm watching the jury because look, I'm right next to them when I'm asking the questions. I want to know, look, there's some jurors in every case that 
the case starts, your, your guy's convicted. There is nothing that's going to get them to change their mind, barring a miracle. <clears throat> so I immediately look at them and say, oh, I'm going to put them aside. You're focusing on the witness. The guys the, that are doing, the guys that are got their arms crossed and that are shaking their heads to you or right. laughing at you. That when you walk in in the morning, you say good morning to jury. Some people are like this, won't even look at you. And some people are, hi, nice to see you, sir. Nice to see you. Those are the people that I'm talking to. So I want to appeal to them. I want to get them on my side. And while I'm pounding the witness, if I make a funny joke, I'll look to them and give them a little wink. I mean, look, this is pure manipulation. So you want